This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our series in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 23. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God who indwells us to control us. This is a choice we have to make. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege, all the things you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at our outline. We are still under Roman numeral 2, down to D, number 4 as I have in bold letters here, the community reaction, prayer for boldness. And then after that, we should get into the community life and problems. So let's begin with the community reaction from what they've just seen with the apostles report. <clears throat> in this next section, we see these early believers reacting to the arrest and then release of Peter and John from the Sanhedrin. It reveals some important characteristics of their attitudes, uh, the attitudes of growing, maturing believers. And we'll see these attitudes revealed in their prayer and their actions. The apostles, they will reveal their dedication to mission. God responds to these right actions and attitudes. Let's look at the church's response summarized from some <clears throat> references to the Old Testament. The church's response, the church's response includes an ascription to God drawn from Hezekiah's prayer in Isaiah 37, 16 through 20, particularly 24b. A quotation of Psalm 2, 1 through 2. We see that in our verses 25 and 26. The reference to Jesus' passion in terms of the psalm just cited in 27 and 28. And a petition for divine enablement in the Christian's present circumstances, 29 through 30. All right, let's get into the community's reaction for boldness. We see this in verses 23 through 31. Verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. We see on their return, they come back to what we call here their friends. Now the friends here in this context is their fellow believers. It's a word that can mean friends, but here in this context, I think we should say it's the Christian community that they were now getting along with. This report shows that there is a clear division forming between Christians and non-Christians. So the apostles fill in the crowd of what happened and the attempted restrictions placed on them. The early believers knew that the heat on them is turned up and more confrontations will come and be even worse. They will go to prayer. Verse 24. The perfect thing to do, go to prayer. And when they heard it, that is the report, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Well, let's break this down a little bit. And when they heard it, they raised their voices. Notice the word together, together. The word homo thumadon. It means with one mind, one accord. We might use the expression with one spirit. So they're together on this, and they raised their voices to God and said, Sovereign Lord. Let's look at those two words for a moment. This is actually from one word, despotes, but you want to get across uh, the full meaning of what they're trying to say here. 
The word itself means master, but at the same time, in this context, they have the idea of sovereignty, the sovereignty of the Lord or sovereignty of God, and him as ruler as well. So you kind of have all these ideas wrapped up into this one term. In the New Testament, it refers to the slave-master relationship that you have between a man and a man or a man and God. So that's how the word is used during the New Testament times. But here it's used particularly for man and God. A master is in control or has authority over the other. So understand, these believers are submitting themselves to the sovereign Lord. They're going to be his slaves. They're going to be his servant. Uh, they're going to be in obedience and submission to God. Now, How does this fit in their day and time now that the rulers over them want to shut them down? In one sense, the rulers are over them as far as secular authority goes. But God is over those rulers. What does the believer do? The key for the believer is to make sure that he is doing God's will. Then what the real rulers do really doesn't make any difference. As long as you're doing God's will, he'll deal with those rulers. He'll deal with the consequences. Now the thing they say about the sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They recognize the sovereign Lord, their master, <clears throat> as the creator. As creator, he has authority over what he creates. Everything, including all mankind. Now we will also see this master-slave relationship come out in the psalm that's going to be quoted in a few moments. In the next verse, where David is called servant. So the term relates to that as well. What's our application here? If the sovereign master tells one of the mankind to do something, kind of a tricky phrase there, he must do it. The master is in control of the consequences, whether done or not. Now, keep in mind this is a community or corporate prayer. One person may be leading the prayer here while everyone else is listening and likewise praying along in their minds. <clears throat> we see here both humility corporately and a willingness to place their circumstances in the hands of the Lord. They know the Lord is in charge, and they acknowledge that. Remember that next time things do not turn out well for you, leave it in the hands of the sovereign Lord. Here the believers acknowledge that God is in control of all events and circumstances. He is in both he is both creator and sustainer of the universe. Nothing happens outside of his full and complete knowledge and prerogative. He is sovereign master, whether the rest of the world acknowledges that or not. Most do not. <clears throat> In verse 25, we'll move on to 26 at the same time, they make this more personal by using an analogy from Psalm 2 to their situation and people involved. So here's the prayer they're praying. Talking about the sovereign Lord being creator, leads into verse 25, who through the mouth of our forefather David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth stood together, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the anointed. Here we see some quote from Psalm 2, partial quote. Let's break it down. The first line, who through the mouth of our forefather David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. Basically, this means God spoke through the Spirit, through the Spirit, 
through the mouth, or we'll just say words of David. He said it through the Spirit. It's recorded, why do the Gentiles rage? Now, the Gentiles is another term for nations. Anyone that's not a Jew. Anyone that's not within the Jewish nation. Here, we're going to see them equated with the Roman authorities in the application. So, the Gentiles are equated with the Roman authorities. The word for rage, why do they rage? <clears throat> Let's talk about a couple of these words. The word for rage... Put definition up here. Fruoso is primarily in reference, now listen to this, to the utterance of a spirited animal, like a horse, like a snorting of a horse. Anger, or excuse me, eager for the race. The word can also mean anger or rage. So you might say it's enthusiastic anger, as anger often is. Sometimes it's used figuratively of arrogant people, haughty, with opposition to somebody. So we kind of see all these ideas here that the Gentiles are really upset. Seriously. Rage is a good word. So there's this question, why did the Gentiles rage? Second phrase, also interesting. I'm going to put it up there with the definition of vain. And the peoples plot in vain. In vain is the word kinos. It means empty. Figurative, it means vain or fruitless. Now remember, the peoples here are analogous to the people of Israel. So they have the Gentiles mentioned, analogous to the Romans. And the people in vain, analogous to the people of Israel. The point is made that both Gentiles and Jews are against God. Let me read verse 26 one more time. The kings of the earth stood together and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now we're coming to verse 26 from what we just read in verse 25. Let me leave it up there. <clears throat> the kings of the earth. Let's talk about it. Here's their application. They get specific with names. The kings of the earth, we're going to see King Herod, don't mention that in a minute. The rulers, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Here it's pictured as the kings stand together and the rulers gather together. So you have all these authorities gathered together. Against the Lord and against his anointed. The Lord here is God. His anointed, of course, is Jesus. The Hebrew means one who has been anointed, so this is the Messiah. Now we're starting to get application and the time when <clears throat> this sermon was given through these analogies. This is the world's plan to try and stop God's plan. Their plans were described as vain and useless. Um, this, is a, this is a way of saying they're empty. They'll never work. Why even try? To even try and crucify the Messiah, thinking that they're going to stop God's plan, it was part of God's plan. So verse 26 together, Again says, the kings of the earth stood together and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now remember I said the applications come through the analogies. There's additional application here. This is the world we live in. The world is against God as opposed to his Messiah. Why wouldn't it be against God's people? I guess the people who follow the Messiah. That's only natural. Specific application, names named in verse 27, for truly in this city, it's Jerusalem of course, were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. 
So the verses just quoted now have people identified with them. But let's continue in verse 28 before we look at them a little closer. Let me put them both up there. To do as much as your hand, that means power, and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. So, here's the people allied against the Lord and his Messiah. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. Notice, they gathered against God's holy servant, Jesus. His set-apart servant. His special servant for God. Is called a servant. He obeyed God, including suffering all the way to the cross. He's described as whom you anointed, the Messiah. The identification is clear who they're talking about. Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, the holy servant that was done right here in this city. The names are mentioned, both Herod, Herod was half Jew, he was the chief political ruler and in the role of a Jewish king. There was Pilate, both these men famous. Pilate was a Roman governor or what they called a procurator of Judea. Remember, he's the one who gave him the pressure of the Jewish leaders and people to have, by his own admission, an innocent man condemned. And again, I might remind you that the Gentiles mentioned up here in verse 27 are the Romans, the peoples are Israel. So the application of Psalm 2, 1 and 2 is this list of leaders, including the Gentiles and Jewish people opposing Jesus. Now, another way to say this is to say something like, well, just about everyone is against him. And we mean everyone. They are all enemy of God's plan, enemies of God's plan. However, they're not going to do anything that God was not totally aware of and outside the plan. God knew everything that was going to happen. We see that in verse 28 when it comes out to say, to do as much as your hand, power, and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. Now notice this, had decided beforehand. This word is often translated, um, well, either decided beforehand or predestined. Now, let's make sure we understand that term. It's often misunderstood. I haven't written this down for a long time. Um, let's just say right here the Trinity. This is a timeline. Let me get a good line here. All right. Use this term or this figure here for this is eternity past. This here is eternity future. Squeeze that in there. And here's basically time right here. Human history. Before human history began, the Trinity made up of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All right? Let's do it this way. You might say they had a council. And as a trinity, they decided that the Messiah would be Jesus, the second person. He would be sent and become man. He had become the God-man. This all was decided in eternity past. So this is where we get our idea of pre-determined. It was planned to happen, and it did. Then, as 
God look forward in time to see it carried out. Let's say it carries out right here at the cross. All right. We call this his foreknowledge. He knew it was going to happen. He had planned it. So this was all predetermined and foreknown in that it was going to happen. In other words, since it was decided in eternity past, it was foreknown to happen and did. Really helps if you can understand these terms and put them properly in this kind of framework. Foreknowledge doesn't make something happen. Predestined does. Foreknowledge basically knows what's predestined. Let me sum up uh, a couple of terms here, or actually three terms that will help you. Predestined, destined in the past to happen. Foreknowledge, past knowledge that it will happen. Foretelling, telling what has been predestined and foreknown to help, to happen rather, to happen. Foretelling, telling what has been predestined and foreknown to happen. So what this is saying is that all the opposition was predestined, foreknown, and foretold to happen. No shocking news here. Look at our verse again. To do as much as your hand, they're looking to God, and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. And now the application of Psalm 2 is coming out towards these people and towards the Lord. Now we just got through seeing a moment ago that God is creator. That he's a sustainer. That he not only sustains, but he controls. He's the sovereign Lord. All this is part of his plan. And this is something that's a good thing to go back on when you think about what's going to happen next. You may not know, but you should know who's going to control what happens next overall. It may be something wonderful, it may be something very difficult. Let's look at 28 one more time. To do as much as your hand, referring to power, and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. So, all these things about the opposition from the kings and rulers and Gentiles and people, it was all in the plan. All decided beforehand it should happen. So, all the opposition was predestined foreknown to happen and foretold to happen. Knowing this, that opposition is coming, what do these early Christians do? They saw this in the life of Jesus. They knew that God had planned all the things that happened to Jesus, the good things and the bad things. Verse 49, And now, Lord Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Now they want to bring themselves into the equation. Let's break this down. And now, Lord, look upon. That's a way of saying pay attention to their threats, what they're doing. And grant, give to your servants, notice, Servants also mean slaves here, very restricted. You're, that's who you obey because here's your master. Everything he tells you to do his will. One of the ironies here is that they are free to speak as slaves, and that was only something given in the secular world to someone who was permitted to from their master. So they're being told they're free to speak. And they do that, as it says, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. So these Christians want God to take into account these threats. The inference is for God to protect and provide for them while dealing in justice with the threats. They do not pray for relief from suffering and persecution. 
but to be given strength to speak with boldness and to these people and for God to work mightily among the people, as verse 30 brings out. So he wants God to not only deal with them, uh, those in opposition, but with these people who are making this request, the believers. While you stretch out your hand to heal and miraculous signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I insert miraculous because that is implied in the idea of signs here. Obviously miracles. So what they're asking is that while God is performing miracles and wonders in Jesus' name among the people, that they at the same time are bold in their witness, even in the face of threats. This is a good model prayer for us in the face of persecution, when we're suffering from others for whatever reason. Ask that God work with you and give you boldness to proclaim the truth, strength to tolerate the opposition, but at the same time, remember God's in control. God responds in verse 31. He responds in two ways. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. The first response from God we see here is that the place in which they were gathered was shaken. The spontaneous shaking of the place they were at shows that God is acknowledging their prayers. This shaking is rare uh, in Scripture, but we do have it. We've had it back in Exodus 19.18, and we'll see it again in Acts 16.26. The second response is, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. They have the power of the Spirit to enable them to speak the word of God boldly. Let's sum up what we've seen. Make some application here. Persecution is starting to come upon the Christian community. The believers go to God in prayer expressing their dependence on Him. They recognize God's sovereignty and control and call for justice for the opposition and boldness in speaking. God responds in a miraculous way with shaking the place and enabling them to speak boldly. Some application. In the face of persecution, Pray that God will work in the situation and give you the strength to carry out the mission of telling others of Christ. Have you ever heard, ever had, I should say, someone come after you for something that was totally unfair? Um, I had that, I can recall one specific time when I had a, a manager come after me for something that I was... I don't know what I was falsely accused of, but it often happened that I did something or didn't do something. But I mean, I'm not perfect, but uh, I don't remember what it was. But he was unhappy with me, called me back to the office. And this guy's life was really pretty empty. I knew him well enough, had worked with him long enough to know that uh, he's an unbeliever. And I just popped the question at him. I said, uh, what are you going to do after retirement? I kind of took him by surprise. But he actually misunderstood the question. I didn't really ask him what he's going to do uh, when he retires and he's going to go out fishing or anything. That's not what I meant. After retirement is over, is what I said or meant. And of course, after retirement, people die. And I explained to him what I meant. What are you going to do after that? People don't want to talk about that. They avoid that thought. But it's a pretty good application when you are confronted with something that's unfair. And even if it's not because you're giving the gospel, if it's for something else you're being accused of, uh, take the opportunity. 
You're not really too worried about the consequences. You get him by yourself, which didn't happen very often, back in a room, a private room. Take the opportunity to raise the question. At least he knows you're not too concerned about what he's trying to do to you, but you want him to see truth. Begin to think about truth. That would be my concern for him. And maybe he saw that. I didn't get much response, as I recall. Well, let's continue with our thought here of application. I'll put it some more up on the board here. As God predetermined and foreknew what would happen with Jesus, his servant, so God has predetermined and foreknew what he will do with each and every one of you. He knows what's going to happen this afternoon in your life and tomorrow and the next day, next year. What do you do to acknowledge that? Well, depending upon the Spirit for strength and direction. What do you do to acknowledge that? You depend upon the Spirit for strength and direction. God has given you everything you need, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how much or at what level of persecution. Stay controlled by the Spirit. Stay on mission. Be willing to do whatever God wants you to do. Well, that had a lot of practical application from what was going on with these believers in the early formation of the church. And now we go on a particular description of what community was like, community life was like. Community life and problems takes us through 432 through 511. Number one, all things in common, example of Barnabas. So what we're going to see here is a summary of how believers love their fellow believers and put that love into action. In verse 32, we see the unity of these early church believers. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and mind, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to them was his own, but they had everything in common. Let's talk about the word mind here I translated. Some of your translations use the word soul, and that's often a translation in many of your modern translations. The word is suke. We've talked about it a number of times. Basically, it means the breath of life. It's what gives life. It's the inner self. It includes the feelings and thinking. It covers a lot of ground there within the inner self. When it says that there are of one heart and mind. Here's the idea. They are together on mission and agreement on what they're supposed to be doing. This shows how committed they are to each other and to mission. They're going to work together, share everything in common to accomplish the mission. This situation is unique and that at this time, now listen, economic conditions are deteriorating, political unrest with Rome, and the religious authorities are starting to persecute these early believers. These early believers, and by the way, they're not called Christians yet, uh, though that comes later in Acts, but I may refer to them as Christians, but I'm talking about the early Christians here, the early forming church. We see here they hold up a united front. Now remember, there's still basically one huge group of people in Jerusalem. There's little evidence that they spread outside the area yet that could well happen, begin to happen because of after the day of Pentecost. Uh, but they're pretty much in the area of Judea and Galilee. But they are still largely together growing spiritually as a new community. And remember the situation, I mean, I thought about illustrating this somehow, but just basically picture it this way. They are forming the early church where you're in the number of thousands now. Well, basically, you have Jerusalem, the leadership, the people, the Gentiles, the other Jews, the religious leaders against them. But they've got a pretty good number right now in, in one sense. And they're going to show their unity here in the next few passages. Some of these Christians were suffering economically. 
some had come down to the area, like the apostles, left their homes, left their jobs. Of course, they had a particular mission. It wasn't typical of all Christians. Some Christians still had their own homes, which was normal. Some still worked jobs, though jobs probably were getting more scarce now. They had personal possessions, we see that. But they didn't consider them so private or so possessive of them, but they couldn't share them with others. Now understand, this is not communal living. All right, It's not the example uh, for a church to have communal living or monastic living to go out and separate from society like the you know, familiar with the Qumran community, live away from society out in the caves or something. They didn't go off and live in the desert separated from society. They show that the early believers united. They had a united front in getting the mission of the gospel out. They came together and shared their needs along with their faith and reached out to the community. They supported each other and demonstrated their love for others by caring for others. As I said, the apostles and probably others had come from areas outside and they needed support right now. They didn't necessarily have a home or, or anything particular to, uh, place to stay and they would need their support if they were to stay with the group for right now and keep it strong. What we see here is Christians committed to God their fellow Christians, and mission. They're committed to God, their fellow Christians, and missions. They were responding in extraordinary ways to God and the people. They would consider themselves as the righteous remnant of Israel. Remember, they're still all Jews. Their prayers their love and action shows they're enthusiastic about doing the Lord's will. Those with more were committed to helping those with less. And God is miraculously working among them, approving of what they are doing and the apostles. Verse 33 reports what the apostles were doing. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The heart of their message is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It says, and great grace was upon them all. The people were acting in grace towards one another, being aware of each other's needs and helping when they could. And grace giving to others in need. Verse 34 gives us some of the results of this. And there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses were selling them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. The term selling, present participle, indicates this is a continuous thing. It's not like everybody just suddenly sold everything. It went on for a period of time. I think there's other things going on here, though it's not in the passage. But I think there's anticipation of these people even having to leave the area or going to lose anything anyway. So they're going to get rid of it right now and spread it among the other needy believers. So there may be more than one reason they're doing and going this far. But the one that's mentioned that emphasizes they were doing it to help other believers. You can't stand there and not live in a nice big home and then not help believers who don't have enough to eat. That's not what Christians do. You see the idea? So they got rid of or a lot of property. But as the need arose and people could, they would sell this or that to help meet the needs of others. Verse 35, they laid it at the apostles' feet. 
And it was laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The people were submitting to the apostles on this redistribution of resources throughout the community. It was distributed to each as he had need. So we here see the apostles trusted now as their leaders, dealing with the distribution of some of these goods to others. Remember, there were still some 12 apostles. As far as we know, they're all still here. And they're amongst this larger group and doing these type of activities. And um, Luke is reporting to us what was going on. Now we come to Joseph. Joseph, also called Barnabas, was used as an example of a Christian doing the things just described. Verse 36. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he did what other people were doing. His name's Joseph. Popular name. Probably why they used the term or the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Some scholars say that's related to the word for prophet. And so the word for Barnabas is related to prophet. And that's part of the prophet's job sometimes is to encourage. It may be. It's hard to always prove this. He was a Levite. Now under the Old Covenant, Levites did not own land. Numbers 18.20, Deuteronomy 10.9. But by the first century, things had changed. Levites are noted as often wealthy, well-educated, and not all were priests. Some served in the temple area, keeping watch over the gates, policing the area, instructing and copying the Torah. Barnabas here is said to be from the island of Cyprus. History tells us that the Jews settled the land of Cyprus during the Ptolemaic period in 330 BC but were expelled in 117 BC after rebelling. So Barnabas means Son of encouragement. That summarizes one of his characteristics, one of his traits as a person. This is the same Barnabas who will work with Paul and reach out to the Gentiles with Paul. Notice he's from a Gentile area. Here Luke introduces him into his book. He's citing him as an example of someone selling what he has and bringing the proceeds to be distributed. Now, after this particular account of Barnabas, we come to Ananias and Sapphira. And if you know the story there, then Barnabas here is set in contrast to them and the stuff they tried to pull. Well, our passage here sums up both the attitude and the actions of the early community. Persecution will increase, and believers will show themselves united in a common goal and care for each other. Notice the great unity here, rare in the history of the church. And I think these particular circumstances uh, was part of the reason they had to have unity. Uh, you can't have one or two individuals become well known and suddenly he's put down, the next two put down, the next one somehow disappear. But they came in great numbers and they stood in strong numbers and they were united. Like I said, this is rare in the history of the church. Also, remember, this time is unique in several ways. The persecution, um, the fact that it is early church, God is using miracles at this time with the apostles. The mission is just coming out, and their mission right now is to go to Jerusalem, and that's exactly what they're doing with this 
large group, united front, if there are 5,000 spread around the area of Jerusalem, perhaps spreading out into Judea, then they're doing the job. Persecution's next. And they show that this is what we're supposed to be doing right now. Now, let me just talk to you for a moment here. Sometimes God will have us do something like this, like maybe sell something you don't need. Go somewhere you never expected. Do something you never thought of doing. Because that's what he wants you to do. Now, you're controlled with the Spirit, maturing in the Word. Those things may happen. You might find yourself having gifts you didn't know you had, and you have to go to seminary or somewhere to prepare. You may find yourself in a situation where God has brought those people to me to help. And that's the only way I can help them, is do something drastic. People won't understand it. People won't respond uh, in a positive way towards you. They'll say, are you crazy? But no, there are times you do things that God wants you to do that'll be unusual. Now, I'm not saying, in fact, I'm trying to make the point that we don't all suddenly unify and sell everything. We don't do that today. There may come time, there, excuse me, there may come a time in the future when that might be the only choice we have if we're going to survive. I don't know. It could. But as far as I know, around the world, this would be very rare. Areas where Christians are highly persecuted, you might want to help others survive if that's the case and get rid of your stuff. But this is not typical. Let's make that clear. This is not typical. It's not expected throughout the church. It was an early church situation, and they're responding to that situation. Later on, you'll see Christians have their own property. They have their own homes, their own communities. They're not doing this everywhere else. No. That is not what they're supposed to be doing at that time. Then we close this section with Barnabas presented as an example of this attitude to the early community and to us as readers. It is the character of a maturing growing believer, supporting each other while depending on God. And then Barnabas will be partnered up with Paul, and he will go out to minister with the Apostle Paul when the time comes, and they will do great things. So Barnabas, you might say, well, he's shown here to have a great attitude great attitude and God will use that man in great ways in ministry towards the Gentiles. Let's close with our translation from where we started today. Verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our forefather David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth stood together and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom he anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do as much as your hand, power, and your plan had decided beforehand should happen. And now, Lord, look upon their hearts and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and miraculous signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the number of those who believed were of one heart and mind, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to them to him was his own, but they had everything in common. 
And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses were selling them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Then Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Father, this has been another wonderful and informative lesson about the early believers. Thank you for what we've learned from them, the unity, the love, the obedience to God. Challenge us with what we've heard today. Control us by the Holy Spirit so we might make the proper application. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.